Uh, the Honourable Member for Thornhill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First and foremost, our hearts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine, uh, with those who have friends and family suffering, with those around the world standing and watching the bloodshed of the men, women and children in a war zone paved by destruction of a malevolent dictator who knows no bounds to his carnage and unprovoked violence. And to those in my own community, those who have at the beginning joined in prayers in churches, in synagogues, in mosques, in gurdwaras, and everything in between, to the now countless organizations raising money and sending goods directly to the people of Ukraine, helped by the spirit of generosity of so many who just want to help, like St. Vladimir Ukrainian Catholic Church in, in Thornhill, or the countless efforts by Chabad Lubavitch in sending help, load by load, matched further by dollar uh, for dollar donations by the kindness of community members who want to go the extra mile. I'm going to take a moment to get a little bit personal in this House and speak to those who have been misinformed, those who have succumbed to the propaganda and the blatant lies espoused by the Kremlin. I am a first-generation Canadian. My parents arrived in Canada in 1974 from Odessa, Jewish refugees who left the oppression of the former Soviet Union. And Putin's regime had persisted with this narrative of a neo-Nazi government uh, oppressing Russian speakers, despite the fact that President Zelensky's native language is Russian, despite the fact that he himself is Jewish. And it's an absolute perversion of facts. This country has a democracy, it has freedom of speech, it has freedom of religion. In the face of that propaganda, I want to acknowledge those specifically in my community and all over the world who have demonstrated a remarkable courage. The tens of thousands of Russians in cities within Russia, within our own country, within the world that took to the streets to express their outrage, facing threats of harms, hundreds of them arrested for their bravery to speak out. Mr. Speaker. There is great concern in my own community from those who condemn these actions, Russian speakers themselves, those who have roots in Russia, and those who stand with the Ukrainian people. This is Putin's war. This is Putin's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, a free and democratic country. The attack on Ukraine ordered by Putin is the first European war since the Second World War with a, that is a serious violation of international law and on humanity. This attack threatens not only Ukraine, its people, its many diaspora communities, but, Mr. Speaker, it also threatens Canada. Our own security has always been tied to that of Europe. 100,000, that's the number. That's the number of Canadians who paid the ultimate price in the two wars in Europe. And while we've enjoyed the longest period of relative peace and prosperity since that Second Great War, a peaceful world is one that we played a role in establishing. Madam Speaker, Vladimir Putin's evils know no bounds, and silence in the face of evil becomes its accomplice, and it ends up becoming evil itself. And remaining silent is a betrayal of our conscience and our values, and ultimately it is a betrayal of our own freedom as well as our safety and security. And while I support the actions taken to date by the Government of Canada, more needs to be done. Because we will one day be asked, during this dark chapter in history, did we do everything that we can do? Can Canada, could Canada have done more? I think today the answer is yes. Madam Speaker, the government should expel the Russian ambassador. The government should direct the CRTC to terminate the licenses of state broadcaster that spread uh, disinformation and propaganda. Russia today, RT should be removed from our airways as other authoritarian state broadcasters operating here. The government should also make every effort to seek the removal of, or of, of Russia from organizations like the G20, like we did from the G8 the last time this happened. As you would have heard from my colleagues in this House, I will add my voice to theirs and say this. An immediate implementation of visa-free travel for Ukrainians wanting to come to Canada. And I know that steps have been taken, but our EU partners have already done this. And while I support the measures announced to date by the Government of Canada, I also understand that they are not going to stop the invasion in Ukraine. However, we must one be day be able to say that we've done everything that we can. And the fact remains, again, today we can do more. 
Many in this House will say that some of what I'm about to say discounts the situation faced by, Ukrainian, uh, by the Ukrainian people fighting to defend their nation. This is, you know, the now, the now uh, over one million displaced Ukrainians about the women sheltering children from unspeakable harms, about the tragedy unfolding in real times of so many who feel helpless in their ability to change the trajectory of evil. But I believe that it is in our interest and in the interest of democracy in Europe and for the security of our own country that we must explore every option to do more in the face of what we are seeing. We know that the Arctic is one of Russia's strategic priorities. We've seen it through their actions and we've seen it through their commitments. We share that border. And now, more than any other time, we must commit to our own security in the wake of destabilization in Europe. We need a plan and we need a renewed commitment to take this seriously. We need to think long, or longer term about defending the Canadian Arctic and our sovereignty. We need a plan on purchasing F-35 jets. We need a plan to modernize NORAD's early warning system. We need a plan to fix our national shipbuilding program. We need a plan of joining, uh, about joining missile, uh, ballistic missile defense. And we need a plan for closer cooperation with our Scandinavian allies and, of course, the Americans. We've committed to that before, and we need to commit to it again today. Madam Speaker, our nation's defense strategy is as important as our nation's energy uh, policy. And I'm glad the members opposite realize that the two are linked. Canadians know that energy is vital to our lives, and we are learning every day that it's more and more vital to our security. I'm not the one who said this. The European Union said this. Our partners abroad have said this. We have witnessed over the last six years that this government and its green energy policies contribute to seeing Canada's oil and gas sector destroyed. And its contributions to increasing our reliance on foreign oil from countries with abysmal human rights records overrun with despots and dictators that function without impunity is clear. Canada is the fifth largest natural gas producer in the world. And with the stark reality, we can't get gas to Europe. We don't have the infrastructure. We can't get pipelines built. Getting resources to Atlantic tidewater is vital to our economy. It's vital to our uh, environmental goals, and it's vital to our own uh, security. Because we, can't, we can be the source of security for European democracies today, and that matters. Madam Speaker, Russia supplies 40% of Europe's natural gas, and it uses this to intimidate Europe and intimidate Ukraine. And that matters. And it matters because of their constant threat to cut off that supply, that supply that provides warmth in the winter and economic activity throughout the year and stability to hundreds of millions of people. Without it, most, we will most certainly see a crisis in, uh, in Europe, a crisis for the economy and a crisis for their, own, uh, for their entire continent. Canada has the resources to ensure that this is not going to happen, and we must take these threats seriously. The world changed last week, and I see that I'm running out of time, Madam Speaker. I just I want to end by saying for the people of Ukraine facing war, for the millions of Canadians of Ukrainian heritage uh, who see their roots under attack, for international rules-based order, for our own security, Canada's official opposition will continue, as we have been proud to do, to do everything that we can to ensure that Canada steps up and does its part. That starts with treating our energy security as a priority. Putin's attack is not only an attack on Ukraine, and I'm glad my colleagues agree. Putin, it's a grave threat to global peace and security and democracy and our collective safety and security. The government has said so themselves, and I'm grateful again for that. And while the world witnesses the bravery of the Ukrainian people, citizens fighting for their lives, for their country, the bravery of a president leading from the front, we too must remember that they are not fighting only for themselves. They fight for all of us, and our support must go beyond what we have seen today. Our support must withstand the test of tomorrow. Madam Speaker, I hope that members of this House support our motion today so that one day we will be able to say, as a country, that we did everything we can. Questions and comments. Questions and commentaires.